Hello and welcome everybody to our presentation on scaling open source software in a large telco R&D environment. Unfortunately, we're not able to join you in person at OSPOCON Europe, um, but thanks to support from Linux Foundation, we're at least able to contribute to the event uh, by means of our recorded presentation. So whenever you have a question or would like to discuss one of the topics we bring up here in more detail, uh, feel free to reach out to us using the email addresses that you can see on the slide here. And we'll also show them at the end of our presentation. So who are we? Uh, my name is Georg Kunz. I recently joined the newly created Ericsson Open Source Programs Office and I'm a contributor to multiple open source communities and I'm on the technical steering committee of the Linux Foundation networking project, Anuket. And I'm Gordon Nilsson. I've been working at the CTO office of Ericsson with open source related questions for at least 15 years and uh, primarily with compliance and how we actually engage in the sense of consuming open source, but also with, with going out in different strategic initiatives and, and contributing to different projects. So I'm pretty happy to see that we actually are now going into an OSPO setup in the CTO office going forward. So let's take a little quick look on, on the different paradigms that we have seen at Ericsson. And of course, this picture is rather simplified, but nevertheless, I mean, if you go back a number of decades, Ericsson took use of different open source bits and pieces, but this was very much a technology supply activity. We saw these things as smaller components going into our proprietary offerings. And roughly at the millennium shift, we, we started to take use of Linux as the operating system and swapping out proprietary operating systems and for that sake, other commercial operating systems. And by the use of Linux, we, we also got the full Linux ecosystem, which basically meant that we saw more and more open source coming into Ericsson that, that wasn't just these bits and pieces that we previously had seen. And 10 years ago or 12 years ago, perhaps even, we saw virtualization coming in to the industry. We see containers, we see cloud native, uh, we started with SDN controllers, we have seen OpenStack, we see cloud native computing today. And of course, these things even more put the efforts on that open source is so much more than just these small technology supplies. It's actually full technology elements that can almost stand by themselves and execute and do different bits and pieces. So our Thinking then when it comes to technology supply was very much that we, we had the finder keepers mentality. Basically, we took a copy, we kept that in-house and we were happy with that. We didn't really consider so much what happened in the community itself. When we started to use the Linux, we realized very much that this was not a free lunch. There was a lot of these components that actually needed some sort of caring. There was also connected to costs of using open source in the sense of partly that we acquired Linux distributions from commercial offerings or commercial vendors, but also that there was all these bits and pieces that needed to come together to form the bigger thing. And when we now see the virtualization or things like cloud native, it's rather obvious that we can't just take it and keep it in-house. We actually have to join up in these different community projects and we need to be there actively. And as I see, this is something that we will continue with going forward as well within Ericsson. Good, let's take a look at the, the driving factors behind that particularly last paradigm change. And um, when you look at the, at the typical telco technology stack before virtualization came along, it very much looked like the three examples you see on the left hand side of the slide. So uh, technology stack is basically composed of um, a collection of very tightly vertically integrated specialized pieces of hard and software that basically made up boxes that we shipped to our customers to make up the customer's network. Now with virtualization and later on cloud native coming along, um, what actually happened is that those uh, proprietary and tightly integrated layers got broken up, disaggregated, and more or less all of the layers got replaced by uh, open and industry standard hard and software components. And these components or these layers typically expose also open APIs that get naturally defined by the very open source projects that develop and provide 
the software that make up these uh, platforms. So this has basically resulted in very much a tight chain uh, change in how we build uh, our products. Now it's very much disaggregated and based on open APIs. And as a result of that, we of course uh, became active in um, all or let's say in a lot of projects covering all of this technology stack and um, even though uh, on this slide i just show a subset of the of all the projects um, i also don't want to go through all of them but highlight just a few of those uh, for instance on at the bottom uh, with regard to the industry standard networking layer um, we uh, have been very active in open daylight, which has been the core of our SDN controller for virtualized um, cloud environments. Um, now we are also investing heavily in network service mesh, which we're using to realize complex telco use cases in containerized environments. And obviously we are active in Kubernetes, we are active in OpenStack, holding for instance PTL positions in key projects such as Nova or Neutron. And then, of course, a very telco specific thing is ONAP, um, which builds and defines an open source orchestrator for telco networks. Um, in addition to the technology stack, we are also active in terms of the tooling uh, part around this. So, for instance, supporting in, uh, development environments um, by contributing to Thea or Eclipse. Uh, or also contributing to other initiatives and projects uh, such as Eiffel or the Continuous Delivery Foundation, um, which build and define processes for building COICD pipelines. So as you can see, um, this technology change has resulted in us becoming very much reliant on open source software and uh, becoming very active working towards and with those open source projects and communities. So before we start to jump into open source and all of these bits and pieces. Let's uh, take a quick look of what the telco industry was before open source or rather in parallel with open source all over the place on these other bits and pieces. So telco is very much a standardization activity in the sense that we have proprietary development and, and we unite that proprietary development or we get that to interrupt it between each other through standardization. And, and these proprietary implementations then are the resting on these specifications and specifications are the thing that we, we very much relate to when it comes to how do we specify things or how do we get things to work towards another vendor or towards a customer or, or towards a supplier and so on. And, and also a big building block of all of these things is, of course, that these things happen to be friend based, i.e. you, you initiate in inventions and patents on these things. And then you, of course, also can have cross licensing of that, which has somehow formed this industry as well. Uh, the, Horizon for all of these things are, of course, very long term in the sense that you start to do a specification and, and that specification can take X number of years. And when that specification is ready, you start to make an implementation of that. And eventually you reach a market with these things. And of course, these things can happen in parallel, but, but nevertheless, it is a long term activity that is going on in this thing. And, and compared to open source, there's pretty large difference in that sense. And then, of course, it's still an open thing to do standardization in SDOs, but it's still a limited group of participants. It's not open in the sense of open source that anyone can go to a community and start to hack away on code. But this is more in a limited set. And the challenges for an OSPO then in all of this, or rather the responsibilities of an OSPO would, of course, be then to accept and see that these things still exist, i.e. we need to perform a risk management of the patent portfolio. We have to understand that we still have a portfolio of that and that portfolio needs to be able to live in, in parallel with an open source activity. And thus we also then carefully need to do these evaluations and clearance of contributions that we are pushing to open source. This can sometimes be cumbersome and this can sometimes be very easy. That all depends on what sort of licenses is there at hand? What sort of ecosystem does this all spread to, etc.? But the culture here is very much also that when you then suddenly come into open source and you bring open source into this 
scheme of, of SDO thinking and specification writing. Of course, the initial thing is that, that the lim there's a limited understanding of how do actually open source work? What are the mechanisms that do make open source tick in the sense of that communities attract different developers, developers work together towards a best, best possible development of a, of a functional software. And instead, we have had a very much an inwards facing approach to technical challenges in the sense that it's better to solve those technical challenges on a proprietary system and thus take use of it as a proprietary feature rather than actually go out and in a collaborative way join forces to find the best way for that technical problem or technical challenge. And then, of course, another thing which we I think we can see with many open source companies or companies that are more have over longer time embraced open source, there's a huge marketing potential when it comes to open source in the sense that you can actually make make a difference by showing that this is an open code. You can actually enter yourself. Anyone can come in and improve this code and, and, and we are happy to share this code with, with whoever do come to that uh, community. And from an OSPO perspective, then this is very much that we need to define open source strategies so that we can push people to open source. We need to provide training and advocacy of these things, i.e. we need to get people to understand that, okay, I can actually be in open source. There's nothing dangerous with that. Like we can train management to also understand that this is a good way to do things. We can actually accomplish things going forward in all of these bits and pieces. And all in all, this is very much for us to act as a cultural change agent when it comes to changing the culture, changing the perception of open source and and getting open source into the to the heart basically of, of Ericsson in the sense of that it's on equal terms as any other SDO activities that we already today are doing. Because if you look on these two things, standardization and open source, they are not really opposite to each other in the sense that we, we have to choose either or. It's more the opposite in the sense that they complement each other. We will do things in standardization for sure, but we will also do things in open source. And the important piece here is to actually find the connecting points here when it comes to how can SDOs work together with open source and vice versa. And for sure, I mean, the more of these connecting points that we actually find, the more both these parts would remain relevant going forward. And here, from an OSPO perspective, we very much are the ones that then, and this is a bit of a cultural thing, but we are then bridging the gap here between standardization and open source activities, being the talking point when it comes to telling, telling the organization that open source plays a vital complement to SDO and vice versa. So <clears throat> moving from the tech industry in general to Ericsson specifically, um, I'd like to first put Ericsson uh, a little bit into perspective here by giving you some numbers uh, about the company. So certainly Ericsson is a global company. We're active in more than 180 countries worldwide. Uh, we have about 100,000 employees and a quarter of those, more than 26,000 uh, of those are working in R&D. Uh, we hold almost 60,000 patents and those pose a particular challenge as just explained by Gunnar. And across all of the R&D organizations and groups that exist in Ericsson, uh, like on a yearly basis, uh, we have around about 20,000 FOSS registration events happening per year. So what does that actually mean? Uh, of course, we're tracking each and every version of an open source software um, that we use in any of our products. And a registration is either by bringing in a new component um, and, and registering it in our database or by registering like a new version of it whenever we, we bump up a version and a new release gets consumed by one of the product organizations. So you can see 20,000 uh, such updates is a lot and that basically and logically results in uh, another set of responsibilities for the OSPO. Obviously, we need to define and, and create processes that are highly scalable uh, that we can give to our um, development organizations and to guide them 
to to enable them to still move with the speed. Um, and we need to also ensure that we create synergies and somewhat align the potentially very different strategies that exist or can exist across the different business areas that we have in Ericsson. So that we basically have a consistent way of working with the key open source projects that are important for our products. Uh, and hence we need to, to guide and help uh, all of the people basically across different development organizations and business units. Now I said that we have roughly 26,000 people working in R&D and of course R&D is not a homogeneous group. Um, obviously there are different types of organizations within R&D focusing on different aspects of uh, the technology work they're doing. And uh, for the sake of this presentation, I'd like to categorize those organizations in, in three different uh, classes, so to say. They are classic product organizations that um, build and ship products nowadays uh, with a lot of open source software in those products. Um, but they are also research and technology organizations. Um, research uh, doing things which is like a couple of years ahead of the product organizations and the technology organizations somewhat in between product development and, and research, maybe one or two years ahead of the of the products. Um, however, the, the common combining factor is that all of them are kind of working with the same piece of open source software, right? But instead of productifying that and shipping it as a product, as the, the product organizations are doing it, research, technology, and solution organizations, um, they build prototypes, they run trials, they come up with experimental features. And as part of all of these activities, the, the open source software they use is often modified, right, to make stuff work. Um, but typically, and that's a cultural thing, those modifications are typically done internally and also kept internally. So there's not that much outward facing in that regard. And um, now from an OSPRO perspective, we think that there is a lot of potential in changing that and creating awareness for cross-organizational synergies that we can leverage uh, because they, they are enabled by using roughly the same piece of open source, uh, pieces of open source software. So it's one of our responsibilities to foster a cultural change and to make those or those other organizations actively engage in open source uh, software. Um, what would the benefit look like? Um, so I'd like to explain that in a bit more detail. So here, let's first start by looking at classic requirement flow. So let's assume we have our various organizations here and they do all do their thing. So research comes up with some study results, the technology organizations come up with some improvement propo uh, proposals, solution organizations have additional requirements and all of them basically feed their requirements into the poor product organizations. And they need to take this in, they need to prioritize these and then act upon this. And the product organizations at the end of the day obviously need to build a product, which in our case here includes a significant portion of open source software. Now, since resources are always limited, some of these things just fall uh, into the cracks and just get lost. Now, the important observation that we can make and that we'd like to convey to all of these organizations is that due to open source software being part of a product, um, this open source software naturally extends the surface basically where those all of those organizations can work towards. So if research actively engages with an open source project and drives them to implement new features or to adopt whatever new experimental features they have come up with. Um, at the end of the day, whenever a product organization uh, consumes a new version of that particular open source software, we naturally inherit the new features that have been developed jointly by research, for instance, and the corresponding open source community. And the same is true for all the other organizations as well. So the key observation is that open source software allows us to parallelize this process. And thereby the key benefit is that we can actually reduce time to market by leveraging all of the organizations we have in R&D, if they jointly or independently, but anyway, working towards and with the same pieces of open source software that's out there. Um, now, looking at the current state of this uh, in the company, to be honest with you, um, 
we have successfully tested that in practice in a small subset of uh, the organization and it worked very nicely uh, and now we need to scale this basically up to uh, to a wider R&D organization and that's part of the cultural change activities that we need to drive. Yes <clears throat> and let's have a little look on some of these current challenges that we are facing today. Uh, let's start with looking a bit on uh, on the outside pieces. I mean, if you look on compliance, like going back 15 years, for instance, it was very much a legal and license compliance activity. I mean, it was a matter of understanding which licenses were included, and then we fulfilled this when we distributed something to a customer. Uh, usually a programming language was C or C++, etc., or Java for that sake. Uh, today, I would say that we are shifting more and more into the security and traceability. That doesn't mean that the legal and license is not important anymore. On the contrary, that's equally important. But there's a lot of focus on these security parts and, and also the traceability. And, and this comes a bit from, from that complexity increases. I mean, we, we have container images, we have uh, languages providing large dependency trees, uh, we have an uncertainty of what is included in these bits and pieces and, and what is making them up, basically. I uh, is understanding if if we have a full insight or traceability of, of the source code, etc. Cybersecurity itself is growing as, a, as an issue in the industry. I mean, there's more and more scare that we will see things that pop up and, and harm us, both from a build pipeline, but also from, from the actual products that we distribute. And of course, all of these things together means also that our customers expect much more today and they expect a transparency when it comes to what sort of open source do they actually get with, with the packages that is delivered from us. And thus this customer transparency becomes more and more important as well going forward. So let's see how these compliance challenges map to the development flow um, overall. So to abstract that a little bit, uh, obviously the the end-to-end -end development flow consists of let's say three separate domains. There is the upstream community, there is Ericsson and its internal processes and R&D organizations, and there are our customers. And then across those three domains, there are uh, a set of separate processes or steps along the development flow and those steps interact obviously with each other. Um, in upstream obviously there is upstream development happening then we take in that source code um, into Ericsson we stage it we package it uh, such that then the product uh, development organizations can uh, compose the the products out of both the packaged open source components and the proprietary components. Um, and then finally, we ship the readily composed product uh, or we feed it into the product delivery process to ship it to our customers. And then as Gunnar already mentioned, the challenge, the key challenge today is uh, to really understand how can we ensure and understand uh, integrity and traceability across this entire end-to-end -end development flow. Looking at um, traceability and integrity specifically, uh, we're starting with integrity rather, um, we need to make sure that we always have a, a clear understanding of what's in the open source software that we consume. Um, where do we, starting basically at where do we get it from? What's the right repository when we're fetching it, um, getting it into the company? Um, we need to understand how we handle it throughout the development flow. How does it get packaged, potentially changed along the way? So that we basically at every step know exactly what's in it um, so that whatever we ship to a customer in terms of a product, um, we have a good understanding of what's inside. Um, <laughs> actually, I was not only talking about open source software, but we rather need to differentiate between binaries and source code. Uh, so um, obviously integrity, handling integrity is um, a little bit easier if you just basically consume the source code uh, and then build everything from scratch, package it and shipping it to the, to the product composition step. 
Um, however, that is obviously a huge burden in terms of time and resource consumption on the development organizations. So um, since they want to uh, act with speed, they have a desire to also consume binaries. And as Gunnar mentioned before, container images have become one of the primary sources of delivering software, and they are mostly, naturally, composed of binary. So um, what we need to, to come up with is the right tools, and the right processes and methodologies to trade off, basically, or find the right balance between consuming binaries to give flexibility and speed to organizations, while at the same time um, ensuring integrity so that we know what's actually inside a product that we ship. In addition to integrity, we also need to ensure that uh, whatever we do along this development flow at each and every step, we have traceability so that for every product that we ship to a customer, we can actually trace back to the very specific um, version of an open source software component, basically what's inside of the products. And in case of vulnerability showing up, we basically know which products are affected and where it came from and which version of open source software we need to um, to fix. In addition to ensuring integrity and traceability, we also need to streamline the false compliance handling process. I mentioned the 20,000 false registrations um, a little bit earlier in this talk, and obviously here it means we need to balance again speed, allowing uh, development organizations to, for instance, easily move to a new release of an open source software component they, they consume, versus um, being very stringent uh, in terms of the compliance handling and, and, and basically doing all our due diligence checks whenever we move to or register a new version of an open source uh, software component. And the only solution to that is basically automation, um, automating this as much as possible to minimize the, uh, the manual interaction here. And from this, basically, we uh, deduce, uh, again, further responsibilities for us in the OSPO. We need to, again, define scalable processes and policies, methodologies, and develop tools that leverage automation as much as possible. And we need to adopt and understand industry best practices and, and bring them into the entire organization. Now, talking about best practices, what are those, right? So the, the challenges that I just mentioned, it's not that we kind of told you how to solve this. It's really, uh, to some degree, open challenges uh, for the entire industry. Uh, but still, even though this is a challenge created by open source software, we believe that the best approach to solving this is using an open source approach and an open source mindset. So as it is an industry challenge, the industry needs to come together to jointly solve these issues. In particular, since there's no single silver bullet to it, um, that would solve all of the problems at once, but instead in good open source fashion and the various open source communities out there addressing very specific subsets of those challenges. <laughs> and then again, that's the final responsibility for us in the OSPA. What we need to do is um, we need to ensure that we engage uh, in the right open source initiatives such as OpenSSF, Open Chain, Continuous Delivery Foundation, SPDX, to just name a few, to make sure that we evolve the approaches developed there so that they meet the requirements of the industry and that they actually complement each other and solve the industry's needs overall. So that takes us to the end of this talk. Uh, maybe worthwhile to just recap some parts of what we have been talking about. As we said, I mean, technology evolution is something that drives open source culture. And what we mean with that very much is that, that basically it takes time for open source culture to grow into a company that maybe have a proprietary portfolio initially, but, but it helps that open source actually drives technology evolution in different bits and pieces. Uh, we see that there's a complement between open source and standardization. Thus, they are not like either or, as we talked about previously, they, they will be there together. It's just a matter of finding the best connecting points and bridging that gap that we talked about. Uh, of course, a very important part and, and maybe a key thing for, for us as an OSPO people in, in Ericsson is to, to leverage the mindset across the full R&D organization and, and actually beyond the R&D also. I mean, we. There's a lot of people that will come into contact with, with open source also outside of that. 
Uh, and then coming back to the previous slide that Georg were talking about, I mean, super important that we, we see I jointly addressing these key challenges of security and traceability. I, I don't see that we can solve all these problems by ourselves and, and neither can anyone else probably. So thus, this is definitely something where a community can step in and add and help and actually produce results out of. So, so with that, I just want to state what Georg already said on the first slide. I mean, feel free to reach out to us if you want. I mean, we are there via mail or, or via Twitter for Georg then. And uh, please, uh, please stay in touch with us or reach out to us in whatever way you find appropriate. And we will try to answer you as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you.